Hello, my friends and enemies. Glad you are here. If you enjoy this video or the channel as a whole, please consider subscribing, hitting the notification bell, liking the video if you think we did a good job, and most importantly, sharing this video everywhere. We would greatly appreciate it. Your support means everything to us, and thanks to everyone who already supports us. Bit of a disclaimer, I have had my doubts about the show, but this is just me trying to give an unbiased, objective review of the Rings of Power. If they do something good, then I will praise them. If they do something bad, I will call them out. But I will try to look at the show from a perspective of entertainment, lore, realism, and cinematic quality. So please bear with me. This could be a long one. Oh, and it's going to get pretty spoiler heavy. So if you want to watch the show without knowing anything, you might want to skip this one. So the episode starts out with a Rondir being dragged into an orc camp by some orcs, and we see shots of humans being imprisoned, begging for help, while others are forced to dig nearby. Why are they digging? It's an open area that is above ground. It isn't a standard orc pit that breeds orcs or anything. It literally is just an 8 to 10 foot drop in a hole on the surface, but doesn't show really any purpose. That is a strange thing for a story to tell, or rather not tell me why I should care. And why are orcs, presumably working for Sauron, capturing and torturing and putting to work the very humans that would probably support his campaign? I mean, they have the blood of their ancestors who worship Morgoth in their veins, remember? You know, the elves and humans keep bringing it up in prior episodes. So why enslave those who would increase your ranks, if that were true? I have more questions than answers, and I don't really want them to tell me as much as I want them to show me. Knowing them, they'll just tell me instead of showing me, because that is this writer's style. So, here we have Aran Deer finding out that members of his garrison are also imprisoned. The Warden, his best buddy, and a few other elves. How convenient. But how does the garrison of elves get captured by orcs? Let's see if they bother answering that question. Doubtful, though. Galadriel wakes to a new environment. She is on a ship, Numenorian, and Hallbrand is nearby with some food and water. She eats a little, but doesn't drink anything, though, weirdly. You'd think you would be pretty thirsty after being, you know, passed out, devoid of food and water for who knows how many days. But okay, whatever. The gate above opens and Galadriel steps out to the ship. She has a cool design. I'm not a shipmaster or very knowledgeable about ships to an expert's extent, but it looked interesting despite anything else. The crew seems to be very ethnically diverse, which doesn't follow the lore that Tolkien left us, but that is expected change. You know, For clear explanation, the Adain were the first men created by Aru Luvatar, and they saw the sun and traveled towards it, some ending up in uh, Beleriand. Though there was Finrod Felagund, yes, that Finrod, who found men and befriended them. Others are said to have been seduced by Morgoth into worshipping him. Some repented and fled, becoming the ancestors of the Adain. There were essentially three houses of men, and when they joined the fight against Morgoth in the first days, the house of Beor, the house of Haleth, and the house of Hador. The house of Hador was noted as having blonde hair and fair skin. The house of Haleth is said to be similar to Hador, but shorter in stature. The house of Beor had fair to swarthy skin and mostly darker hair, but with some that was lighter of color. It is unclear how swarthy they were, but the, those described the most clearly had a complexion that of Mediterranean descent. Through that information, it would make sense that the Numenorians would typically follow suit, but it would be interesting to see how they depict the rest of Numenorians. Galadriel and Elendil meet for the first time. And Elendil has Galadriel's dagger. Galadriel and Halbrand are being taken to the rulers of Numenor without knowing where they are. 
Here's a better shot of the ship from behind. The sails appear to have an Asian style, which doesn't really fit Numenor from what I know of them. However, I could be incorrect. If you are familiar with these ships, please let me know in the comment. Uh, dual masts is an interesting concept, though I'm not sure if it is functional. Uh, the tower to the right of the ship looks very much like CGI. I've seen better in an Assassin's Creed game. Up close, though, it doesn't look half bad. But they would have to provide more detail because of the closer range. There's a spearman on top of the tower. Why? Don't know. I feel like an archer would be a better choice... Since it's the top of a tower, what's he going to do? Throw his spear? At least an archer could shoot fire arrows at enemy ships and disable them somewhat or signal for help to the mainland. A big rock face. Looks better than the tower. And what is Halbern looking at? He's looking past the rock face. It is definitely a green screen. Come on, post-production team. You're supposed to make it look good. Pretty cool visual. A nice landscape that shows more sculpted faces of variety and distant shot, presumably of the capital. Then there is a shot of a sculpted body of a man with a waterfall coming out of his hand. Definitely CGI. They call themselves professionals. <sighs> Paul Brent asks where they are, and Galadriel, of course, just knows. How? Don't know guess your skill in deduction is beyond any being an Arda. And worse, Galadriel doesn't open her mouth to talk, and it looks like it's wired in place so it doesn't accidentally move. So not to confuse the viewer, mistaking her for talking. It's so infuriating. Stop mumbling! Aside from the obvious CGI bridge and statues, the entrance looks like it's just large enough to fit through. If they weren't completely centered, they would lose their mast although it would be difficult for them to get their entire fleet if they were headed out to war. It should have made it larger. Cool landscape of the capital. Not much really to be said about it. Wow, they are really relying on nice landscapes to hold the show together, aren't they? I admit, it's pretty cool looking. It looks a lot larger than the other shots I have given credit for. So, explains more of the population sitting. Glad to see they actually put the manpower into making the place look alive and not scarce and empty. It seems to be a pretty popular thing to do nowadays for some reason. Galadriel gives a monologue history lesson for Hallbrand about his people versus the Numenorians. His people sided with Morgoth, and the Numenorians sided with the Eldar, the Elves. It's a case of tell, don't show. Would have been a great opportunity for a flashback of war and the two sides of men in the distance. Morgoth's faint silhouette among the battlefield lines. A shame, really. The scene says much about what is presumed later at the end of the season. Looks are often deceiving, eh, Halbrand? Under the landscape shot. I like them, but they use them way too often and they need better touch-up. Presumably the palace. We can see the white tree of the line of kings. It makes an appearance in Return of the King. Also, the layout is heavily reminiscent of Minas Tirith's upper levels, despite it looking more Greek in style than Minas Tirith. The armor here looks either bronze or it's golden decoration only, a display of wealth, but poor protection from harm. It almost looks like leather that Elendil and his crew are wearing, but almost like it is painted. But I'm going to lean more towards bronze mixed with leather. Finally, we meet Tar Muriel, who declares that no one bows in Numenor. This is 100% Amazon, not lore. And Galadriel rolls every single R she has ever said. Someone charged the showrunners with crimes against humanity. Of course, Galadriel haughtily declares herself all her titles and stares down Tar Muriel. Hallbrand just says he is Hallbrand. Right. 
Now we get our Farazan walking into the spotlight. Halbren and Galadriel explain their brief relationship, and Galadriel makes demands like she owns the place. Smooth. Definitely not a lady. She declares that the island was given to the Numenorians, to which Tarmiriel denies and says that they earned the island. While merely technicalities, Galadriel is right on this part. Men were given the island, although they earned it, but could have been given nothing in return but their territories in Middle-earth. Galadriel is highly unlikable, and Tarmiriel is as well. At least they have that in common. I don't understand how the writers thought this would be a good casting, plus writers making the worst verbal catfight in the history of Arda. This is poor drama. The conflict is forced, and then again, none of this is canon. Paul Brand steps in to defuse the situation and is the least cringy dialogue so far in this conversation. So Galadriel ends up being restricted to palace grounds for three days, and Hallbrand gets the run of the place until the Numenorians can figure out what to do. Then Hallbrand calls out to Elendil and gives him an awkward hug. I'm assuming Hallbrand is trying to blend in with the Numenorians, or there's another reason. Oh, look! Hallbrand lifted Galadriel's knife from Elendil in the middle of an auditorium filled with people watching this go on, and no one saw him. <sighs> what kind of script is this? Now we learn that Elendil used to be of a noble house. This is not the case. Now he is a captain among the sea guardsmen with a son who has followed his father's footsteps. This is them trying to tell us about them rather than show us them naturally. These writers are terrible. Why would Tarmiriel care at all about this random captain if he is a nobody? Here we have a side and a front shot of the ships. Those sails look so fake it is unreal, pun intended. It seems that there is a race to get a position on a ship. Our first look at Isildur, one of his fellows unwraps the wrong rope and gets flung out above water while holding the rope. Isildur gets him back on the deck. I'm not sure why, what all the rope work was for. It looks like they are going straight and there must have been a hundred ropes being undone and retied over and over for no apparent reason. Anyone with sailing expertise, please lend me your knowledge in the comments. I would like to know what they are doing. Isildur's fake sister is announced and it seems she has arrived with a horse. Isildur is excited and opens his arm, exclaiming, There you are! And his sister opens her arms, but he goes to the horse. Awkward humor is awkward. Very out of place, especially in Tolkien. I really do like this image of the white tree. Symbolism of men's strength and the hope of lasting peace. Let's see how long it lasts. Tarmiriel shows her racist tendencies toward elves, just like the elves show their racist tendencies towards men. It appears the orcs are the only non-discriminatory ones out there. They at least enslave everyone equally. Tarmiriel, who in lore was of the faithful, accuses Elendil of being of the faithful. One of those who wish to mend the relationship between themselves and the Valar and the Eldar. But Tarmiriel cries, Treason! All because Elendil followed the Sea Guard anthem of The Sea is Always Right and brought an elf to shore. She's not very good at sailing seas, which is pretty standard for women in Numenor, to be fair to lore. So Tarmiriel tasks Elendil with a sword? The one time they should tell and not show, they do the opposite, and it leaves us wondering what he's supposed to do with it. I mean, it almost seems like she wants him to, like, assassinate her or something. I feel for you, Lendil. I really do. I don't know what she wants either. I'm doubtful we will hear it directly from her. A map of Numenor, or a map image of Numenor, I should say, gives us a rough estimate of where Halbrand and Galadriel were adrift at, showing us that it is nowhere where it would make sense for Southerns to be, or Elves to take a dip in the water for a quick swim back home. It is a long way to Middle Earth. Back in the Southlands, Arondir sees orcs being uncomfortable in sunlight. 
and we see Arandir with his buddy walking a log down the above ground hallway. Notice that they had foot chains strapped to them. We hear them, but don't see them, but they are supposed to be there, and apparently they are magical since they can extend ridiculous lengths. The two get with the warden, and they plot to escape and get word back home to come back with some armies. It is a shame that they just sent away one of their commanders. The very evil that Gilgalad was worried about Galadriel finding is the very evil that found his people. Smooth, Gilgalad. Smooth. The orc taskmaster notices the three elves talking and tells them to get back to work. More orcs show up. I don't know why, but the fat one on the right looks familiar. Like he has reused orc from the films. Can't shake it. Uh, Jed Brophy, who has played in the films and as many characters, including a dwarf of Thorin's company and orcs and more, is in this. At least they got a decent actor for hidden roles. The Taskmaster comes over and the Warden talks back to the captors about a tree blocking their way. And the orcs want it cut down, but the Warden wants to go around it. Taskmaster says they show strength, so they earned a water ration. The showrunners try to make it seem like it's poisoned or something, but it's not. And as the water gets to Rondir's buddy, the Taskmaster slashes his throat with a dagger. Rondir agrees to cut the tree down. He gets a sight above the trench and begins to cut it down. In Numenor, two guards search the streets telling us that a Galadriel escaped, and this isn't the first time. Of course, she is above on the balconies and ledges of the buildings and pops down right behind the guards as they run ahead to search for her. I don't believe it. She can smile. It seems she is enjoying herself. How dare she? People are dying in the Southlands. Doesn't she even care? We find out that Elendil is right behind her and caught her eyeing a skiff to steal. A man finally got to jump in the Great Galadriel. About time something interesting happened. She threatens his life and they talk about how she has the look of his kids. Not sure if they were going with a joke that she is thousands of years older than all of them, but I think they... I would be giving them too much credit if I said they were. Apparently the queen wants Elendil to babysit Galadriel. No idea why when she thinks he is a dirty elf friend. I'm not sure how, but Morfid Clark manages to make Elvish seem drab and boring with no life. She can kiss her acting career goodbye. Elendil reveals that he can speak Elvish and that she has friends among the Numenorians. The faithful. Again, I don't know why Tarmiriel would put them together so that more could go wrong. He reveals that they have a house of law or lore. The way they say it, it could be either one. I think it's supposed to be lore, though. That holds elvish statues and such. And she wants to go see it. And they head there on horseback. At least the music seems to be better in this part, but it still holds a different kind of fantasy feel than Middle Earth. Okay. That is just creepy. Just stop smiling. An albino horse was weird enough. We don't need to add to the scene where there's even more weirdness. Oh, and all of this is shot in a strange slow motion style that doesn't fit Tolkien or even most fantasy at all. Here's a close-up uh, shot of the freaky smile if you weren't already convinced. So Halbrand is trying to convince a blacksmith that he knows the craft better than anyone and he will do anything to make things, but finds out he cannot forge without the guild crest. Did I mention this is not lore? Nice try, Halbrand. Looks can often be deceiving. Halbrand gets into a conversation with a man with a guild crest, but he gets mouthy with the man when the man gets mouthy with him. This brings the fellow's friends over and spooky music. The men are implying that since he isn't close to the elf, and that she probably wants a man of better breeding. You know, totally Tolkien. No dialogue like this would ever disgrace Tolkien's work, but the hedonist in his deplorable ways would be in the works as very vague generalizations of how civilization collapsed by the end, but never in a brazen or crude way. But then Halbrand surprises the fellows by agreeing with them and offering to get them drinks, and all is better. Such a smooth talker. Looks can be deceiving. 
Of course, he clipped the guild symbol from the fellow by the time he left. Unfortunately for him, he was caught. The man and his fellows catch up to him and he offers it back, but they get violent. He asks them not to. They laugh and hit him. Then he gets up and goes to town on them. Blood splatters on the screen, breaks a guy's forearm, and bashes the man's face against a wall. I can't even picture Aragorn doing this. It feels off. One of the fellows runs off and gets the guard, and Halbrand is caught. Galadriel is in a room with Elendil, and it is filled with scrolls and parchment. She draws Sauron's sigil on a paper, and Elendil asks for everything related to it. Elros, Elrond's brother, built this place, and while Galadriel knew Elros, she was closer to his brother. This painting is way too modern for the setting. Elrond looks like he came out of a Snapchat filter. The prior king of Numenor was forced from his throne for being friendly with elves, and he still lives. Another twisted event of what actually happened in lore. Come on, guys. Meme this. It's, it's literally waiting for you right there in the image. The scribe brings a book, and finally Gladriel figures out that it isn't Sauron's sigil, but a map of what we know as Mordor. But conveniently, they have the entire plan in the Black Speech that Sauron would enact should Morgoth fall. Huh. Blatant plot railroading. Who could have seen that coming? I mean, let's be honest. They just happen to get something from a spy from long ago, and it happens to be the plan that just happens to be in case Morgoth should fall, because that was what they were ever expecting. Just, yeah. How convenient. The Harfoots are prancing through the woods in costumes with Sadak Burrow singing, Nobody goes off trail, and the rest tramp back, and nobody walks alone. Insert King of the Hill meme here. This where the cult is? Nobody goes off trail, nobody walks alone. Yep, this is it. Nori's dad's foot still isn't healed. His wife is worried that they'll be left behind because they can't push the cart without him. Why not? He could ride with anyone who could push him. He talks about his former wife, who it seems died, and how he met her. It's a bit of a heartwarming spot in a massive world of no life. I just don't get how he had never seen her before in such a small camp. Nori and Poppy get into an argument about helping the stranger. Nori wants to get Sadak Barrow's book and give it to the stranger. Poppy doesn't want to help him and doesn't understand why Nori does. Nori blackmails her friend into helping. Nori gets into the book, but Sadak comes back and there's a weird bout of what I think is supposed to be comedy. But it was pretty awful. Sadak goes and gives a speech about those left behind during migration. And it is strange and should make everyone uncomfortable considering Nori's dad's situation. Of course, the stranger just walks into the camp and sits near a fire. You know, having the paper that Nori was going to bring to him, but hadn't yet. He just happens to have it. Makes me think they cut scenes for this. Of course, he puts the paper too close to the fire and it catches fire. He trips and falls and trips and falls and trips and falls again. He ends up knocking things over and bringing others crashing to the ground in a heap. This gets all the Harfoot's attention. The stranger gets wrapped up in the Harfoot made it environment and gets up shouting and yelling nonsense while trapped in a net and it terrifies the Harfoots. They try to hide. He calls for Nori, the only word he apparently knows. The Harfoots blame Nori and the law says to kick him out, her whole family. But instead, Sadak moves to them to the back of the caravan meaning if they fall behind, they are lost. It really is a stupid story that can't even be called an arc, and I do not look forward to reading or seeing any more of it at any point in time. It's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> Elendil and his kids sit down for dinner, and Isildur wants to wait a season from being promoted or something, which catches his father off guard. 
His sister is a snippy, annoying girl, and I can't fathom why she is in the story since she isn't real, except perhaps to get on my nerves. Elendil gives his speech from the trailer. The past is dead. We either move forward or we die with it. It seems Elendil doesn't believe as much about the faithful as we would be led to believe. Isildur doesn't want to be a sailor and gets his sister into an apprenticeship with the Builder's Guild. Not really relevant to the plot. Why are we wasting time? What are the showrunners doing with pointless wannabe drama? It feels more like a soap opera with dysfunctional families than a well-written story by a genius and master of escapism. Galadriel visits Halbrun in the prison and lets on that while at the House of Law, Lore... They say it like Lore... And it's like, it could be lore or law, depending on the accent, but I'm still assuming it's lore. She found out that he is more than he claims to be. Galadriel figured out that he is the king of the Southlands. He is Aragorn 2.0. They did it, folks. They made the dumbest storyline bait and switch ever. Galadriel hints that she is about to have an army. A landscape shot of the city at night looks kind of cool, but knowing it isn't real really bothers me. I wish it was an actual, like, mini model or something. Tarmiriel climbs a tall tower and seems to be telling her father that the moment they feared is here, the elf has arrived. This makes really no sense, considering... It's insinuated that several days has passed since they have arrived, and Hallbrand's been around doing his thing. Galadriel has escaped multiple times from her palace guest-like prison. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And now she's like, it's finally arrived. I'm like, oh, so the moment the elf arrived, you didn't go up there and be like, hey... The moment you feared is here. The elf has arrived. And it's like, is there a prophecy of some sort? Is something causing her to be bothered by this? Like, what is going on? Nothing makes any sense. This is some crazy plot arc that Amazon schemed up and has no bearing on anything at all. The Harfoots are migrating. Nori's family is falling behind, but the stranger shows up and says friend. Sonori comes up with a plan that is simply the stranger will help the cart be moved. That's it. This is painfully obvious. It is CGI'd in. It hurts so much. Five seasons of this? <sighs> Back in Arondir's camp, he spots the taskmaster who killed his friend. The warden does martial arts, crouching tiger, hidden dragon stuff, using the chain on his ankle as a whip. Arondir does the same. Back in Arondir's camp, he spots... Well, I already did that part. Let me go on more. <laughs> oh, this part. Oh, gosh, I can't. This can't even be classified as fantasy anymore. It's just silly. It has fallen into the category of comedy as a parody. But it isn't even funny. The orcs are hiding from the sun and release a warg. The warg itself is not really that bad CGI wise, but it could be better. The, the movements in the ground just don't match up. And the elves look terrified as if they don't have weapons. Elf lady grabs a spear out of a corpse nearby, because weapons should just be laying around on people, and runs closer to get into a stance to stab the warg, like an idiot would do. You don't advance on your enemy until you are in a stance. She gets barreled to the ground and barely touched before reaching the fetal position and has a little gash before the warg starts eating her. This was horribly produced scene. I have seen theater acts at high school made better. Like, what are the other elves in Arondir doing as one of their numbers being eaten? Nothing. Sounds like elves would love to see their compatriots be harmed as they stand aside. Gladriel and Arondir both do this, not to mention the warden. One by one, the elves get eaten by a warg. 
They attack in a single file, apparently. And instead of grouping up to kill it, they all decide to die individually. It's a horribly acted scene by those dying. Keep in mind that Glorifindel, the elf warrior, soloed a Balrog of Morgoth. What did you say? A Balrog of Morgoth. These guys can't group up on a single lazy-eyed war grunt. Now Arondir decides to do something. He pulls on the Warg's chain and does his famous trailer flip. And the Warg crashes into the tree's roots and gets trapped. And Arondir uses the Warg's chain to lock him in. The orcs get wise to this and pull on the chain. Like they should have been doing all along. And as he gets flung towards them, he grabs a stick off the tree and stabs it into the neck of the Taskmaster when he lands. And just when the warden breaks his chains and runs up the trench to the top, but the warden pursues him. The warden gets this close to him before Arondir launches the spear and hits the target, saving the warden. All in a day's work for the Avengers. Oops, wrong universe. Or is it? Hmm... The Warden apparently didn't account for arrows, and he gets shot by several. Arondir is still chained. He is captured, and before they kill him, they are stopped and told to bring him to Adar, or Adar the big bad, it would seem. Except that Adar actually comes to them. And this blurry picture is Adar. I believe he is an elf some equivalent of the Elvish of the Black Numenorians, I guess. Then the scene cuts to credits. There was a whole lot of nothing happening in this episode. Well, beside making mistakes and terrible attempts at so-called plot. But what do you think? Did you like it? Find it entertaining? Did it put you to sleep? Did it drive you crazy? Let us know down in the comments. Thanks for sticking around. Remember to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. But most importantly, please share this video everywhere. Thank you for your support. Walk in the light, my friends.